much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is always normal to experience drift away from our course. In this particular instance, I wish to return this debate to its proper heading and course. And so, Mr. Speaker, I shall restate the resolution before us and thereafter make my brief intervention in this regard. Mr. Speaker, the resolution to this House states as follows. Whereas on the section 1091A of the Value Added Tax Act, Cap 15.42, the Act, it is provided that the Minister of Finance may, by order published in the Gazette, amend the schedules to the Act. And whereas it is further provided on the Section 1092 of the Act, that an order made pursuant to Section 1091 of the Act is subject to an affirmative resolution of Parliament, except where the amendment is to customs tariff headings only. And whereas the Minister of Finance seeks approval of the draft value added tax amendment of Schedule 3, number 2, order to amend Schedule 3 of the Act by affirmative resolution of Parliament to exempt imports by an elected parliamentarian for the benefit of children, the vulnerable and needy persons in the constituency of the elected parliamentarian of toys, food supplies, care packages, including items for personal use, such as food, personal hygiene products, and other personal protective supplies, gift items, including personal presents to be given as part of the Christmas holiday season, Christmas decorations, including Christmas lights, ornaments and accessories used for decorative purposes during the Christmas holiday season. Be it resolved that Parliament by Affirmative resolution approved the draft value added tax amendment schedule 3, number 2 order, which amends schedule 3 of the Act to exempt imports by an elected parliamentarian for the benefit of children, the vulnerable and needy persons in the constituency of the elected parliamentarian. Mr. Speaker, I note that this resolution calls for the duty free exemption to parliamentarians for the benefit of children, the vulnerable and needy persons in the constituency of the elected parliamentarian. Of course, as colleagues on both sides indicated of toys, food supplies, care packages, including items for personal use, and the whole spectrum of things that could be imported. Mr. Speaker, members on this side, never provided vehement and uncompromising opposition to the motion, as members opposite argued. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition did indicate that it was a noble gesture. But of course, he expressed concerns, which of course are legitimate concerns, Mr. Speaker. And so I joined the leader of the opposition in saying that it is a noble gesture to, to particularly provide assistance to the poor, vulnerable, needy, and children, particularly given that this group was neglected by the government in the so-called Economic Recovery and Resilience Plan, which gave away virtually all the money, virtually all the money, to the FFF contractors in the guise of shovel-ready construction projects. Mr. Speaker, for the past four and a half years, we have been speaking about the vulnerable, the marginalized, the dispossessed in this house. We were laughed at, we were attacked for making effective representation on behalf of the marginalized and the poor people of this country. Mr. Speaker, over the past four and a half years, whilst members on this side of the House made effective representation on behalf of the vulnerable, tens of millions of dollars was spent giving CPR to a dead horse called DSH. Tens of millions of dollars were spent giving CPR to a dead horse called, called DSH. And in this COVID-induced economic crisis, Mr. Speaker, when people are gasping for air, now they come and attack the opposition as if they suddenly discover 
there is something called vulnerable people in this country. In fact, the member for Castro Central was saying now they're trying to identify, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not quoting her wrongly, about identifying needy people in the constituency. This is something, Mr. Speaker, that all of us should have known way in advance the constituencies that we represent. We must understand the demographics in the constituency. It is not now we have to identify needy people. Mr. Speaker, there are tens of thousands of people who are suffering from the economic and social effects of this pandemic. And the government has not provided the kind of soulagement that they needed to be cushioned from the pandemic. This is a fact. Why attack members of the opposition for stating the facts and for expressing concern, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I believe, like I said, it is indeed a good gesture at this time. I note it is restricted to only parliamentarians. Now, Mr. Speaker, not oh, they're in the holding pattern. Mr. Speaker, on my way to Parliament, and I want to join the member for you for North in expressing that concern. Many persons have asked the business community, persons who normally engage in humanitarian work throughout, and they are asking whether they are going to be considered if they import things for poor people in this country. Mr. Speaker, we should not give the impression. We should not give... We should not give the impression that we are passing laws to benefit the people. Like I said, Mr. Speaker, we have not provided any opposition to anything in this House to bring relief to the poor people of this country. Mr. Speaker, Parliament, of course, as noted by many, did not do it in times past about the same Christmas lights we are talking about. This has absolutely nothing to do with a pandemic. And they are complaining, and they are questioning the motive, that as if suddenly an election is fast approaching, and we want to disguise love for people in strange ways, Mr. Speaker. But that is the perception of the people of the country. But certainly any effort, Mr. Speaker, to bring relief to the poor people of this country will never be opposed by members on this side of the house. Absolutely not. Now, Mr. Speaker, I wish to now discuss the philosophy and principles of the VAT. The VAT is intended to be a non-discriminatory tax, and hence it was felt that all items be taxed at the same rate, with few or no exemptions. In practice, however, many countries have adopted two or three rates. There is a main rate for almost every item, followed by a zero-rated for essential items and a lower rate for certain sectors like tourism in the case of the Caribbean. The other fundamental principle of the VAT is that exemptions should apply to goods or services but not organizations or people. This is based on non-discriminatory principle of the VAT. There are exceptions like diplomats based on the Vienna Convention and certain charitable organizations. But the intention was not to grant exemptions to organizations or people on the grounds that this would be discriminatory. So what you are saying as if it's a free for all, for all organizations, this is certainly not the case. But as I prepare, Mr. Speaker, to conclude, no, I'm not landing yet. I'm not landing yet. I'm just about to commence the approach. Mr. Speaker, I cannot conclude this very important presentation without placing this resolution in the context of the Value Added Tax Act, as there has been much misinformation, fake news, and lies surrounding the implementation of the VAT. In fact, when the member for Kasri Southeast was on his feet, followed by the member for Babuno, who talked about we introduced VAT, and many others, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I must set the record straight. Mr. Speaker, the value-added tax is a broad-based consumption tax. It is sometimes referred to as goods and services tax, GST, 
which is implemented in 166 countries of the 193 countries who are members of the United Nations. And it is implemented in all OECD countries except the United States, where the individual states levy a sales tax, which is more burdensome than the value-added tax, as it is a cascading tax implemented at the same rate on all stages of production. So, Mr. Speaker, whilst it is okay for them to play the politics and to blame the Labour Party for implementing that, it was not the former Prime Minister Kennedy Anthony and the Labour Party that implemented that in the rest of the OECS or the rest of the Caribbean or in 166 out of the 193 countries in the United Nations, Mr. Speaker. The value-added tax, on the other hand, is levied on the value-added at each stage of production. Most significantly, all of the Caribbean states have a value-added tax or broad-based consumption tax. It is also important to note that value-added tax systems were imposed as part of our multilateral obligations, Mr. Speaker. St. Lucia does not operate or exist in a vacuum. It does not, Mr. Speaker. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we must understand, we must understand as part of a process of integrating our country in a rapidly changing global environment, appropriate domestic regulation is a critical element of ensuring net benefits from financial flow. Mr. Speaker, in this regard, our efforts at the national level, regional level, or international levels are supported by engagements with the international financial institutions to shape the international financial and development architecture to become more favorable to small states like St. Lucia. We are part of an international implementation framework, Mr. Speaker, based on constructive cooperation and mutual accountability between developing and developed countries. Behaving, behaving as if every country should implement that, and we should not. But there are many countries that are supporting our development, and they have VAT rates that are much higher than us. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, at 15 percent, we were sharing that, that rate with Dominica, I think, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. All of them have a higher, all the others have a higher VAT rate. We must always do the responsible thing, Mr. Speaker, if we are to promote understanding that the international financial architecture should promote economic advancement of developing countries like ours, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I continue to navigate this very delicate subject, you'd wonder why I'm saying all of this. It is because, Mr. Speaker, that the government has blamed the former administration for implementing the value-added tax and promised the reduction and eventual removal of the tax. Mr. Speaker, it was a UWP administration that opened the VAT office, that staffed the VAT office, and gave the IMF the undertaking that they were going to implement VAT. St. Lucia cannot be vexed with us doing what is necessary to meet our international obligations. Mr. Speaker, having made that promise, they were forced to save face by reducing it by 2.5% as part of the five to stay alive promise. But it was 95 not to stay alive, as we can see in this country under the United Workers' Party. Mr. Speaker, we now know this was a lie perpetuated by the United Workers' Party, all in an effort to gain office. It is also well known that the value added tax Honorable was Honorable. a replacement tax for a number of taxes which were repealed. Honorable member, we're not debating the merit of the VAT. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the member for Castries Southeast raised it. Mm -hmm. So I'm responding. I must respond. I have well, an I'm obligation to respond. respond to anything no, really Mr. Said, Speaker. We're not debating the merit of the tax. No, we, 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 we are. We are. Because the point is, Mr. Speaker, the scope and coverage, because it's impacting us now. And, I, and just bear with me, Mr. Speaker. In addition, the scope and coverage widened to cover services to make it a broader base tax. In the case of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, value-added tax collections 
in 2019, 2020 was 349.4 million, accounting for 42.2% of the total tax revenue. And it is by far the largest tax revenue item, Mr. Speaker. This is relevant because it has implications for the COVID-induced economic crisis, Mr. Speaker. In order to put this into context, the net largest tax revenue item is import duty for which revenue collections total 121.6 million, more than $200 million less than tax intake from the VAT. Now, Mr. Speaker, we are all aware that people do not like paying taxes, but in order to run the affairs of the country and finance all the services provided by government, including security, education, and health, we must raise taxes to pay for the services, Mr. Speaker. But it is clear, Mr. Speaker, I, I, will not, I will not be interrupted by noisy elements of opposite, you know, Mr. Speaker. I, I am here to represent the people of the People's Republic of Liberia, and I shall do so. I don't know of this constituency. Um, I know of Liberia, not the People's Republic. Oh, so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But, but, uh, but, Mr. Speaker... Uh, but, Honorable Member, Honorable Member, before you get off into space and we, get, we lose you, <laughs> um, reduce your altitude a bit. You see, you see, Mr. Speaker, aeroplanes operate at different altitudes. They have different operating altitudes. You have twin otters and BN2s opposite that can only go to about 6,000, 7,000, a few thousand feet. You're, you're, you're talking about major 380 that will operate, you know, way up in the sky, Mr. Speaker. But they will land. And obviously, Mr. Speaker, the point is, over the past four years, we have just given away, by the games of members opposite, approximately $240 million, Mr. Speaker. We have lost. In, in tax revenues because of the fight to stay alive storybook beginning. And of course, we would have been in a much better position now to provide relief to the most vulnerable. And that's what we're talking about, the most vulnerable, Mr. Speaker. And the wider point is, Mr. Speaker, we must come to this House and stop this unnecessary debate the eyes of the entire world are fixed upon St. Lucia as if we are jurisdiction that must not pay VAT, pay no taxes, but we want everything. And we expect foreign countries to, to impose higher VAT rates on their people to send money to us. We are giving them the impression as if all we want to do is just cool out and they must make the sacrifice for us. We must be careful that we do not send the wrong signal to the outside world. So I conclude, Mr. Speaker, I conclude by indicating that this tax, the VAT, had to be introduced as part of our international obligations, and the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party at the time attempted to cushion the impact of the VAT by having a large exemption list of basic goods and services. Nowhere in the Caribbean we had more zero-rated, unexempted items than in St. Lucia. And that was to bring relief to the most vulnerable, the dispossessed, the marginalized in this country. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.